my title was a bit different, so I worked a bit, I changed that one to uh, how to interact with farmers to develop tools for assessment of ecosystem services. Uh, and uh, you could also add uh, this one to, uh, to develop useful tools. Uh, because that, I think, is what I'm working with. Um, uh, but first of all, we have to think, why do we interact with farmers? I mean, is it a way to take off the stakeholder interaction box? So if it's that, I think that's... Uh, then you don't need to spend that much time with them, as I have done over my career. Then you can just have a meeting and so forth. Or is it to modernize, modernize the uh, knowledge transfer? Is it to make research results uh, for fit for policy making? Uh, or is it to co-produce knowledge uh, to improve farming management practices? So I think if you're a, a scientist, that doesn't matter if you're me or a more natural scientist, you need to think about this. This is really important. So now we're going back into history. 1969, there was a man called Arne Stein who created this, which is called the participatory ladder. And the participatory ladder is sort of describing different de degrees of interaction with stakeholders. This is the sort of main reference if you refer to different types of stakeholders. I will not go into discussions about this, but I don't think there are so many social scientists here that would like to discuss that. But the, the important thing is that the further you come up, the more interactive you are. Uh, and I would say that uh, that in the you were talking about, I think that was the sort of almost partnership. It's a long term friend relation and so forth. And I will place myself as well in this ladder. But I think if you then look at, uh, yeah, the one important thing here, I think, which actually relates to Henrik's question. Now it's a pity he's not here. I will give this speech to him directly. Uh, in his room. Uh, but one important thing is that these degrees uh, of in involvement actually relate to different kinds of governance models. I will not go into what governance models are, but there are structures to organize the way we are doing things. And what Henrik said, I mean, uh, said was maybe we want another kind of system. And I think that is really important because the way you interact will actually influence how you think about how to govern uh, natural uh, or human natural systems. This is really, really important. I think here is the clash sometimes between national and social scientists. And I think we need to talk much more about this. I will not do this today because that was not the part, but I think we need, there is a lot of need of discussion and maybe that can be part of the discussion later. But if we tick in these, um, put in these different things, you can say tick off the box of stakeholder interaction. Then you are, I think, down low here on almost manipulation or some kind of therapy that at least the scientists are out there, but not much more. If you uh, want to monitor uh, uh, modernize the knowledge transfer, then you are much higher up and so forth. So I'm not going to do it. So you're moving up the, the ladder depending on the way you think you will interact with these stakeholders. So what does this lead us? In That means so repeat again that the way you see the role of your science, now I'm talking mostly to scientists here, I see there are some practitioners, but we can talk about this later in the afternoon as well, in Swedish, uh, uh, from the practical part of you. But the way you see your science and the way you see your role will actually have Im influences on the way we govern. Uh, the, the natural, human natural relationship. I just, just remember that. Uh, so, I think in my research, I would place myself up here some, somewhere. Where I am uh, actually depends a bit on who I work with, because I'm not a natural scientist, I'm not doing models, I'm not really developing tools. But I, I, I'm here and I would like to be here. And sometimes I may be forced down or I can be forced upwards as well, but I think that's important to place you in some kind of way, and you express several 
words that I sort of understood sort of where you are in the ladder, ladder and it's sort of similar place as me. Yeah, and I think that's a consequence when you work with a lot of farmers. That's where you sort of, you have to be there. There's no other, other place to be. So, coming to the projects I worked with, uh, this is Vastra, Demo, Seamless, Pamo, Seambank, Potato Pest and Climb App. There are projects that I worked with. The grey ones are finished ones, the yellow ones are oncoming projects. And I think uh, there is a sort of learning process. This is over 10, 15 years of work. Big projects, small projects. But I will just show you that they have financings from a lot of other um, lot of spaces. The, the seamless one is the EU project and the other ones are Swedish. Yeah, one was sort of Climate Kick and Eranet Formas is sort of an international project as well. We have been working with ecosystem services. Now I'm not calling them the way that normally you call ecosystems firms, but services related to water and biodiversity, water biodiversity and culture, water soil biodiversity, water culture, soil, pest control and shade, the last one. And if you look at the tools we have developed, we have used models and focus groups. We have used models and a participatory process. We have used model and model linkages, web and a web interface. We have used model process for the PAMO and model and process, and we have used a model and an app, the one that Mark was talking about. And in the potato pest, there is actually just one algorithm and an application. And in ClimUp, we are using models and an app. And that means you could see there is a sort of development where we are using more crudely models to using uh, more app and in, uh, inter internet interfaces. So this is where I've been working and interacting. So in these interactions, who do we interact or who are the people we interact with? Here we said just the farmers, but I don't think that's that simple. Uh, I think there are four to five main actors if you work with mod, uh, models and modelers. It's the model, that's one actor. It's the modeler, it's the app producer, it's the farmer, and it's maybe the social scientist if I'm a part. So we are a group here and we need to understand each other. And uh, just to give one example, I have been involved in several projects where I'm, so I'm the one up there, and I'm in charge of making sure that the process of interaction is working. So I'm making timetables and telling the farmers we're interacting with that uh, that and that date, the model result or the model setup will be ready. But then uh, the model is not ready. This is, I'm taking an example from not the cooperation here in this house. But a model is not ready because they said the validation is not ready. You have to wait another two weeks. And then I said, but I arranged a meeting, so I need, I need the results. So actually the consequence here was that we had to fake results uh, to interact with the farmers. I mean, fake in a, yeah, that sounds really bad. Uh, but we sort of knew where it will head, so we, we had to show as if the model showed these sort of results, uh, and then we, uh, then we had to present and discuss that with the farmers. There was no other solution. You can't cancel a meeting with 50 people coming from another, that's not possible. So I had to do that. So that created a little bit uh, not so nice relation between <laughs> us here in the group. Uh, uh, another question is that, for example, that could happen is that the app producer wants the data in a particular form uh, to be able to interact with because some data types are easier to integrate in the model language they use to code the app. This is something that if you realize that you have the data in a total bad form uh, too late, then you also deliver too late. And then, of course, you have different agendas of all these people. So the important thing here, and which takes a lot of time, and I think that's what you think, is to create trust in this group. And that is, takes time, it's hard, and it's, uh, it's uh, tiring sometimes. 
But also there are some nice experiences. Actually, one tool we used in one of my projects to create trust is to, uh, this is campaign m measurements. So citizen science, these are farmers actually running out and measuring water depths uh, at certain moments in the catchment area, which was what we worked with. Then uh, water modeling in the catchment area, nutrient retention and so forth. And this was actually because we had this problem with the model not delivering in time. But when we started this, everything changed because they thought they, I mean, or they felt they were a part of the modeling development. So. Actually, from being, we thought like, shit, how can we solve this? Inter I mean, entering this thing changed everything. And they were so happy, and actually several years after, they, they phoned us, can't we be part of this? We want to measure more, and we want to, to work more. This was really fun, uh, and so forth. And they were actually linked up to uh, SMHIs, uh, the Swedish Meteorological Institute's website, and, and when it started to rain, they had to run out and measure. So they got, when the weather forecast tell them, run out and measure, they did that. So, or they arranged a neighbor to do the work. So that sort of created a really nice engagement in the area. Another example, which I think is interesting, this is one of my, uh, my friend, uh, one of my friends, he's called Lars. He's a farmer uh, outside Helsingborg. And he was one of the ones I tested the sea bank uh, model with. Uh, and he, um, he, w he, he gave us a lot of interesting information, but also one interesting thing. One day he phoned me up, it was just a few weeks ago, and he said, hey, Johanna, I have an idea. Uh, and then he started to explain us, did you know that the municipalities now have to create these carbon banks? And I think that we can do a part of this. I would like to engage all my farmers in uh, Helsingborg to work with your tool to actually contribute and show how much farmers actually can store carbon and to provide that information to the municipality because we want to be a part of this. And I was like, yes, he's phoning me. That means he has some trust in me, but I don't know how to deliver this now, but we'll, we'll talk about that. I have some ideas um, how, how that can be done. So coming to what can be gained from doing this, I've given some examples. You get a friend, you get some enthusiastic people to work with, and things are really fun when you're quarreling a bit with your modeling friend, but you can also gain a lot of other, other things, I think. Better understanding of each other's perspective both in relation to time and issues. So I have, uh, during my years, I have learned some things uh, concerning timing of farmers in Sweden. Don't uh, go out and try to interact with them when they have harvest time. I mean, that's uh, like no go. Don't try to interact with them when it's hunting time. That's a no, no. So that's one, just one example. User validate model output. That is something that can actually be really useful, but then it demands a lot of uh, pedagogical skills from the modeler to actually do that. What I helped with in one pro uh, project where we had a really complicated model uh, was actually to, to serve as that kind of bridge. As I'm a trained biologist from the start, I have some advantages here. Uh, also, collect data, and that was why I gave an example. User validate model concepts and limitations because each model have its limitations and when you start to to try that out on a on a, a stakeholder farmer they will always why do you limit your model like this can't you take this in and this in and this in and this in so i think that's an important thing you can do you can also receive inputs to the next, or you can use that validation to receive inputs on next step in model development. And actually, the H HBV model used by SMHI has actually been improved from that project. So that can actually happen, but it's a long-term thing. It's not something, I, I mean, you can't develop, you need more project, more money to actually being able to develop that in that way. You can create new ideas for new models. You can develop a user-friendly interface. You can use to validate timing and form of use of the tool. 
and you can increase the ability to integrate economic, social and environmental aspects of sustainable development. Because you get a lot of feedback on different aspects. Then they are not, I mean that feedback is not a model feedback, so you, you need skills to take them in uh, and to sort of put them beside the modeling output, that's a bit a challenge, a bit linked to that cultural ecosystem service uh, research gap linked to that. But you can also increase legitimacy of science, and I th I'll come back to that in the end. So what can be lost? lost? A lot of things can be lost, especially if you start to lose trust. But I think here an important thing is to balance those things, what you can gain and what you can lose. And to think that the inter I mean, interaction with stakeholders, in this case farmers, has to be a long-term sort of take on. You can't leave them out. So just to give an example from Seabank, uh, what we actually, the positive reactions, if we take them, increased understanding of the relations between different ecosystem services, because that became a very, very clear output when you sat and discussed the tool with the farmers. Because then they started to link the different aspects. Even if Seabank just focused on, on soil carbon, a lot of other discussions, then they were sort of tying the knots together. Something happened in their brain. Possibility for strategic use of science in a long term farm planning. We were also testing this on, on advisors and they saw this potential. Some of the farmers didn't see it, others saw it that, oh actually this can be used when I have my advising session. Uh, not every day, not every year, but we can use it every fifth year or something like that. So in a strategic way. Also promote learning about carbon content of soil. There was a big sort of learning. Oh, is it working like this? And oh, yes, I didn't know, but I thought and blah, blah. A lot of things like that. When can we start to use it? That was a very like, I want to use it now. I want to have it now. Very important thing. If we take the negative reactions, they all wanted more crops. More crops, all the crops, I want to choose, I want to pick. More flexibility, I want to decide what should be in and what should be out. We don't ha have time to use it, and there are already a lot of tools integrate them now for us. So that is quite difficult to handle, but I see this as a, as a challenge where we need to cooperate in a long-term perspective yeah, you're looking at what's this <laughs> behind. Sort of erasing the borders between us. And I'm not saying erasing the borders to sort of eliminate different sciences. That's not wha what I'm saying. But I think erasing the borders between us, I think that would be really important. And why do I think this is important to get away with this? Sorry for now putting this man. But I think in general, the science here, I will erase him out. I think the science here, that when we question science, I think it's important, this will be really important. I could have put another man as well, where I'm well acquainted from another country, but um, uh, another governor of a country. But I think if we question science and knowledge, this is partly due to us. So we need to work with that. And for me, working with erasing the borders, but still keeping some kind of scientific integrity is really important. Thank you very much.